with you, Bazalane. Thank you, Tato, for leading us this morning. Thank you, Lebu, for leading us in worship. Uh, praise the Lord for you guys. Thanking God for everyone who serves here at TCM. It's such a blessing to serve alongside with you as we serve the Lord together. Amen. Amen. So, Bazalane, we're starting a new series. Uh, this morning in the book of Acts. For those of you who do not know, there's a way that we preach in the church that you're going to find um, that is consistent. The children can go to Sunday school. Um, The ones that are here, they are released to go to Sunday school. There's a way that we preach um, and that is going through books of the Bible. And so that is what we call the pub and milk, the pub and place preaching of the church. We might from time to time get some takeaway and eat here and there. But when we come back every day, this is how we preach. This is the normal way that we preach in the church. We open the Bible and we go verse by verse. So Acts has around 28 chapters. So you can imagine, we're starting with chapter 1 today. So we're going to be here for a long time. Look at your neighbor say, we're going to be here for a long time. Right. By the time we're done, you are going to... Your act is just going to be inside and out. You're just going to be breathing acts and be thinking about it. Um, and I've been here for the last couple of weeks. And the Lord has just been working in my heart. And so I'm excited to... Just open up and, and uh, share what, what, what God is teaching us here through his, his word. Amen. And so, really, the, the overall series of the book is how, thank you, is how God grows his church. How the Lord grows his church. That's what we're going to see throughout the whole book of Acts, this this, um, this next couple of months as we go. But for this morning, our title is Mission Impossible. Our title for this morning is Mission Impossible. <coughs> Just before I start, I was also told to, um, once Kamu, yes, how's your uncle doing? Is he fine? Yeah, he's Amen. Uh, so I think he was involved in an accident, and uh, it's just been on my heart, um, just praying for him, and so trusting that he's well uh, this morning. Praise the Lord. And also the Pukobias as well couldn't make it this morning. They had an emergency that they had to attend to. Amen. Mission Impossible. Um, and so. One of the things as we come into the book of Acts, as we sort of open it up, we begin to talk about and to see the mission of God, to see the mission of God, to see the purpose of God. And one of the things that's very clear from the Bible, before we even zero in in the book of Acts, I want us to take sort of a bird's eye view and let's talk about God's mission from the whole Bible. God's mission has always been to make God famous. God's mission has always been to make God famous. And even as I say that, that sounds very narcissistic, right? It sounds very like God wants us to make him famous. Right? We wouldn't necessarily have that kind of a view when it comes to any other person. We wouldn't want to make ourselves famous, right? But God wants to make himself famous. And in fact, it is right for God to want to be famous. It is wrong for us to want our name to be famous and our name to be known. But it is right for God to want to be famous. Why? Because God is the most beautiful person in the universe. When God says that he is perfect, when God says that he's holy, when God wants to do something, that there is nothing more beautiful outside of him. Amen. 
So it's okay for him to want to be known, to want to be famous. It's not wrong for God to want to be famous. And from the beginning of the Bible, that's the mission that we see God create the universe. That's why he creates the universe. That's why he creates man is because he wants to share in his glory. He wants to share in his goodness. He wants to share in how amazing he is. He actually is so satisfied and he's so happy in himself that he creates man in order to share that. And so we see, as I take a bird's eye view on the mission of God, from Genesis chapter 1 to 2, we see God creating the world. We see God creating the world. After God creates the world, we see him putting man as the pinnacle of his creation. He wants man to share in his joy. He wants man to share in that excitement. In fact, he tells man, be fruitful and what? And multiply, right? So immediately, the mission is given from Genesis chapter 1. Man, you are to be fruitful and multiply. But what happens to man is that man decides that they don't want to live for God. They don't want to live for God's glory, but they decide that God is not to be trusted. God is not the right person in order to make his name famous. They want to make themselves famous. And so the world then is filled with sin. And after that in Genesis 3, the world starts to be filled with selfishness. Generations go far and and, and continue and God decides to start over the project of making himself known, making himself famous with a man called Noah. He chooses Noah out of all the people of the earth and he tells him, he tells him, even in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, he says, be fruitful and multiply the same thing that he said in genesis chapter one god tells noah once again humanity looks to give itself honor they create what we call the tower of babel in genesis chapter 11 why they want to make their name great instead of making god's kingdom great And so in Genesis chapter 11, God mixes up their language. And so they start to spread to all over the earth. What's the purpose again? So that they can continue to be fruitful and multiply. So that they can continue to make God's name great. So that they can continue to dominate the earth. Out of all the nations that go out of all the earth, God chooses one man by the name of Abraham and he makes a promise. He makes a covenant in Genesis chapter 12 with this man called Abraham. He says that he would make his name great and he's going to make him to be a great nation so that he can bless other nations. And so God creates this nation called Israel. If you don't understand Israel, you will not understand the whole of the Old Testament. Majority of the Old Testament talks about how God works through this nation called Israel. So he gives them laws so that they can be separated from the rest of humanity, so that they can become royal priests, so that they can be the means through which God mediates through himself and through man. Israel would encourage others to love God. They would encourage Others, they would encourage other people. They would show God through how God is working through them. Their purpose, again, is to make God famous. The same purpose that God had from Genesis. So he promises them. He gives them a geographically strategical place in Palestine so that they can be able to continue to spread the fame of God and to tell other nations about how good God is. Sometimes Israel leaves out that purpose, but most of the time we find them actually messing up and falling into the trap of glorifying themselves 
instead of glorifying God. When Israel gets off track, God raises up prophets. That's why we sang the song that says, May God send prophets to those that are lost. Amen. Amen. That's what God does in Israel. He raises up prophets to go and tell Israel and remind her of the purpose that she was created for. The prophet's job was to always remind Israel of the covenant promise that he had made with them, with their forefather Abraham. And so even in her disobedience, God uses Israel to make his name great. When Israel doesn't do right, God raises up other nations so that they take them captive, so that they colonize them. And then they cry out, Lord, this is too much. We want to go back to the way things are. And they go back, but they keep on going to other idols. They keep on wanting to make their name great instead of God's name. In all its ups and downs, Israel was longing. They were longing for a Messiah. They were longing for someone who was going to come and make things right. From time to time, God would raise up Abraham. But then we see which Abraham has flaws, right? He's not perfect. We see him lying. We see him not trusting God. And he raises up Isaac. He raises up Jacob. He raises up David. All men who seem like the deliverer. All men who seem like this is finally the person that we've been waiting for. This is finally the person that's going to deliver us from all our trouble. He's going to take us back to us worshipping God and making his name great. But all these people keep on falling short. Not one of them becomes the person that God expects them to be. Until fast forward Hundreds of years later, Jesus comes to the scene. Jesus is God in the flesh. So God is like, okay, I myself, through the prophets, he prophesies, one day I am going to come myself and I am going to live among you and I am going to show you what it means to make God's name great. You guys couldn't do it. All of you are flawed. All of you are sinful. God then, in the fullness of time, the Bible says in Galatians, God steps out of eternity and he clothes himself with the flesh and he becomes a man. God then, through Jesus, is from David's bloodline. His message is for the Jew and the Gentile. We see him in Matthew chapter 2. He's been greeted by these Gentiles, this Magi from the East. His baby dedication identifies him as a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. So already in his mission, we see that this man is global. This is not just a white man's Jesus. This is not just a white man's God. Already in his mission, he's identified as a light of of revelation to the Gentiles. If you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. We are Gentile. We are non-Jews. Time and time again, Jesus reminded his disciples who considered themselves God's favorite people. He reminds them of God's plan to make his name great among all the nations. This is what Jesus starts to preach. Time and time again he does this. Parables that he tells. He now tells parables about the kingdom. He now, we see him bringing in Gentiles. We see even the people that were outside of Israel. We see Jesus touching them. We see Jesus not discriminating in whom he heals. He goes to the places where people have faith to demonstrate that the kingdom of God has finally come. To demonstrate what it looks like to make the name of God great and to make the name of God famous. He preaches the good news to the Gentiles. He preaches the good news to the poor. He preaches the good news to the Canaanites, to the rich, to the Samaritans, to the Romans, to the Greeks. Jesus comes and he makes 
the name of God to be famous. He lives a perfect life. He dies a perfect death. And we see him in Matthew chapter 28. He commands his disciples. He says to them, go and make disciples of all nations. Amen. In other words, he's saying the purpose, the mission is global. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As you fast forward to the book of Revelation, we already see that the Lamb of God purchases people from all tribes and nations with His blood. And so that shows us the plan of God from the start and how the plan of God includes everyone, includes the whole world. And so we find ourselves in the book of Acts, which is a continuation of the story that, start, that has started thousands and thousands of years ago. So here's the question for us this morning. Now that Jesus is leaving, Jesus has been with his disciples, he has died, he has resurrected. Now that he's about to go back, how is the mission of making God famous going to continue? Now that Jesus is going back to his father, now that he has accomplished his mission, how is the mission that God started in Genesis chapter 1, how is it going to continue now that Jesus is gone? So this is where we're going this morning. Firstly, it's going to continue through the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. It's going to continue through the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. All my points are from the text. So I want you to look at your Bibles. That's where we're going to find what we are saying. The mission of making God famous, firstly, will continue through Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Are you in verse 1? He says, The first account I compose, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given and commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so we are introduced now to Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke is the one that records information about Jesus. Luke was a physician. Luke was a physician and he was a companion of the Apostle Paul. He's the only New Testament writer who was a non-Jew. He writes this account to a man called Theophilus. We don't know much about this man called Theophilus, but we know that in the book of Luke chapter 1, he addresses him as most excellent Theophilus. And so scholars tell us that this might be a, a high-ranking official. He might be writing to a high-ranking government official who was uh, in Roman government, or possibly a wealthy and influential man in Antioch. His name means the lover of God. We don't know who this man really is, but we do know that Luke is at pains to write to him to show him the accuracy, to show him the reality of what he had started to write to him in the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, he was recording all about the works and the person of Jesus. So now, this is the second book that Luke writes in the book of Acts. He wants Theophilus to know the truth about how things really happened. And by the way, we get to be... Uh, this is why I love the Bible. We get to crash onto someone else's letter. Amen. And so by God's providence, he preserves, preserves this for us in Scripture. And through what Luke wrote to Theophilus, we get information about Jesus. Amen. 
the mission that started in the Old Testament is going to continue, then the death and resurrection of Christ must play an important role in that mission. Apart from Jesus' life and death, we don't have a purpose. We don't have authority to carry out any other mission. Whatever we are doing apart from Jesus' death and resurrection, we are going to imitate the people of Babel, trying to build a name for ourselves, trying to make our name great. Amen. If the mission to make God famous continues, then it's absolutely critical that Jesus must die and rise again to deal with the issue of sin. Do you see why? what it says there? Chapter 1, verse 1, he says, I write up things I began to do until the day he was taken up after it by the Holy Spirit, went to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he presented himself alive after his suffering to many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Amen. Jesus wanted to make sure that it is clear that he truly died and he truly resurrected. So he appears for a period of 40 days so that no one doubts that truly, truly Jesus resurrected. Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Jesus did not resurrect, then our faith is in vain. So everything that's going to follow here, if we want to talk about the mission of God, then the death and resurrection of Jesus are very critical to that mission. If that doesn't happen, it means that Jesus is another David. <laughs> Jesus is another Moses. Jesus is another Abraham. They tried, Shem, but unfortunately they couldn't. So we needed Jesus to be different. To come, live, and die, but not just die like the others, but after three days he needed to resurrect. These were great people with great qualities, but they were all flawed and they were sinful. They can't deal with people's unbelief. They can't deal with their rebelliousness. This is why it says here in Acts that Jesus had to present himself alive with convincing truth so that it's obvious that he clearly rose from the dead. If we are going to continue with God's mission, then it can't be on our terms. Amen. It must be on God's terms. So how will the mission of God continue? Through the preaching, through the witnessing, which is the language of Acts, of the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is how you and me will continue to make God's name famous. This is how the apostles will continue to make God's name famous based upon the factual reality of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is why as Christians, we fight when people say that the resurrection is not true. It was just a myth. No, it was true. Because that's where the Christian faith is based. It's based on a realistic event. Amen. Amen. It's not based on a thesis or somebody's theory. It's based on the event that once in a while Jesus, God came to become man and he lived and he resurrected after three days. Amen. Amen. That's how we continue to make God's name famous. By talking about the one person in the universe that God is pleased with, and that's his son. The foundation for the mission is death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where we start. Apart from that, we have nothing to say. Apart from that, we have nothing to shout about. Apart from that, our lives have no meaning. Apart from that, the world has no hope. If Jesus didn't die and resurrect, let us go let us get drunk. There is no hope if Jesus doesn't resurrect. That's how important the death and the resurrection is. Amen. And so, if we're going to continue the mission of God, we must first acknowledge and talk about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel 
is everything. The gospel is everything. The gospel should affect how you think. The gospel should affect how you live. The gospel should affect the vocation and the mission that you are choosing. It all flows from the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So the gospel and your mission are not divorced. Amen. Amen. And we're going to show this a bit more clearly as we continue. Amen. Secondly, secondly, how will the mission continue? It will continue through the coming of the Holy Spirit and the ascension. Pastor, where do you get that? Look at verse 6 to 8. Look at verse 6 to 8. It says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Remember what's happening, Aniti. They are now gathered together after it's been great, right? Jesus has died. He's resurrected. They were shocked. Now it's like there's excitement to say, wow, he's actually, he rose again. He did what he said he's going to do. And so they come to him and they start to ask him a question that this generation is asking. Is this time for economic freedom? Is this time for political freedom? I agree they have forgotten the mission, amen, from the Old Testament. They don't know Horemodimo is still continuing his mission. Banana Uri, this is the time. Let's get them, Jesus. Those who were spitting on you on the cross. The Romans were oppressing us. You've shown that you are key. You've shown that you've got power over death. This is the time for you to restore the kingdom. This is the time to bring us back to the time of Solomon, to the time of David when we were great. You are now going to restore this time for us. But Jesus has to burst their bubble. And he, this is what he says. He said to them, it is not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Basically saying it's none of your business. That's just, that's just a nice way of saying. Verse 8, here's what you need to be obsessed about. Here's what you need to focus on. But you will receive power. Can you say power? Power. 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 You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The mission will continue not only through the death and resurrection, but through the coming and empowering of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you some text that promise this from the Old Testament. We don't have to turn there. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. Listen. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. You will be careful to observe my ordinances. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. As for me, I baptize with water for repentance. John the Baptist says, But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John 1.33 This is what John the Baptist said. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So are you seeing, Basolena, that this is nothing new that Jesus is telling them, amen? This is what the Old Testament had prophesied. This is what John the Baptist has been saying. This is what they should have known that the program and the mission of God is still continuing. Amen. John 16, 7, 7 to 15. John 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. 
What could be better than having Jesus himself there? He says it's to your advantage that I go away. When he stayed, it's when he was telling them that he's going to leave them. He's going to leave them, but he won't leave them as orphans. So now they are sad. They are sad because they're thinking, no, we've had it good with you, Jesus. But he says, it's actually good that I go away. For if you do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. So the Holy Spirit is good for us. Amen. Jesus knew from the start that he will leave. Jesus had already planned ahead of time that he will leave them with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would be the person that will empower them to be witnesses all in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world. As excited as they were about their thinking that the kingdom is coming, they had to wait. Amen. They had to wait. The empowerment of the Spirit is critical if God's mission is going to continue. Let me say that again. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit is critical if we are going to continue God's mission. They were thinking Jesus is now bringing political freedom. They were looking to Jesus. They were thinking Jesus is on you. Jesus said no. I was working up until this time so that you you can go and continue God's mission. Amen. They could not fulfill the mission alone. They needed help in order to fulfill God's mission. We don't have authority to do this on our own. The Holy Spirit empowers them to be able to fulfill God's mission. He guided the apostles to be able to preach. Jesus told them that would preach the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. But he didn't give them a timeline of how that was going to happen. Amen. It was the Holy Spirit who had to guide them. It was the Holy Spirit, and we want to see this throughout the book of Acts, who had to guide them as to the when and the how and the who of how they were to fulfill the mission of God. I'm tempted to go to some of the scriptures, but I won't do it. I want us to wait and see how the Spirit does this. But you will constantly see in the book of Acts, the Spirit said, the angel of the Lord said, in fact, some people have said, I have here the Acts of the Apostles as the title, not inspired. Some people have said this book should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Because it is the Holy Spirit who's directing, it's the Holy Spirit who's empowering, it is the Holy Spirit who's leading them to where they need to go. You'll see this with the Ethiopian eunuch. You'll see this with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. You are going to see that it is the Holy Spirit who is really the main person in the book of Acts. He provided inspiration. He provided in illumination. The Holy Spirit had them to remember. The Holy Spirit provided revelation to the believers so they could preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit would then confirm the words through healings, through miracles, through prophetic insights. The Spirit acted as the confirmation sign that a person was a believer in Christ. The Holy Spirit acted as a blueprint for how the kingdom was to expand, providing the time, providing the place, providing the opportunities, providing the people who would best respond to the gospel so that the local church was established. It was the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. He is God. He directs. 
He convicts, he leads. Certain circles, we have thinned him out. We have muted him. We have muted him. Because we are afraid. Because we are afraid. But without the Holy Spirit, church, what we are doing here is in vain. Amen. It's too difficult. It's too hard. How do you, how do you change people's hearts? I can't even change the heart of my six-year-old. They need something bigger. A man's heart doesn't use your mood to you need someone powerful to wrestle someone to the ground. We can, I can preach, but I must trust the Holy Spirit to do the transformation. You must trust the Holy Spirit to transform your husband or your wife. You must trust the Holy Spirit to do that which you cannot do. We need the Holy Spirit. And as I was reading here, I was really convicted. in terms of some of the things that we also need to put in place so that we really make sure that we are following the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, how is the mission of God going to continue not only through death and resurrection, not only through the Holy Spirit, but through prayer? Through prayer. Pastor, where do you get that? Look at verse 12. So they are with Jesus. He talks to them to say, guys, they're asking him when they're restoring the kingdom. He's like, hey, guys, man, I'm out. <laughs> now I'm going. You guys are going to be left here. I'm not leaving you alone. You're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then he begins to ascend up in heaven. Are you seeing it in verse 9 to, to 11? He said these things. He was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight and as they were gazing intently into the sky as he was going behold two men in white clothing stood beside him they also said men of Galilee why do you stand looking into the sky this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven Amen. Amen that's the good news that's what we're waiting for now we are waiting for Jesus to come back physically to take his church back. But until then, the way that the mission must continue is through prayer. I'm not making that up. This is what they were doing. Look at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. Look at verse 14. Let's read that together. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to what? To prayer. They were devoting themselves to? Together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. They are told to wait for the empowering of the Spirit. What are they doing while they are waiting? Praying. Pray. They are devoting themselves to prayer. Prayer plays an important part in God's mission. In prayer, you are trusting in God to do what you and me cannot do. We cannot save anyone. We cannot change people's hearts. We may want people to change and know Jesus, but we don't have the power to do so. We may desire God's mission to continue and people to come to the kingdom, but we don't have the power to make them change. Prayer is the one place where we call upon God and plead with Him to continue His mission of saving people. That's how His name becomes more famous. The more that people receive Jesus, they are changed by Him. 
They get to see how amazing Jesus is. They get to see how beautiful Jesus is. And God's kingdom grows. And God's name becomes more famous. And we are fulfilling our mission here on earth. Amen. Amen. You need to see this. Let, let me walk you through. Let me walk you through the book of Acts. I don't know. I don't think many of you appreciate the importance that prayer played in the book of Acts. The importance that prayer was played in the advance of the mission in the book of Acts. So, chapter 1, right? Whilst they are waiting, they are praying. Amen? Amen. Whilst they are waiting, they are praying. It says that they gave themselves continually with one accord. Still in chapter 1. Shortly after this, Peter stands up and he explains the replacement of Judas. Remember Judas, right? Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't know Judas. The one who betrayed Jesus. And so Peter remembers that there were 12 that were chosen. But Judas committed suicide. And so now he begins to discern from the book of Psalms. He begins to discern from Psalm 35 that there was a scripture that was forewritten to explain exactly what would happen to Judas. So it wasn't a surprise. And so he stands up and he says, guys, this is the situation. Judas is gone, there's 11. We need one of us, one of us, who's been with us from the time that Jesus was here till the time that he resurrected. We need to replace Judas. What, what, what are they going to do when they have to choose someone like that? Are they going to vote? Are they going to have a debate? The answer is simple. Look at verse 24, chapter 1. Verse 23, so they, they put forward two men, Joseph and called Pasabas and Matthias. So now there's these two options of two people that will replace Judas. So now, how do you make the choice? Verse 24, and they what? Pray. They prayed. They prayed, verse 24. Said, yes, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen. They prayed. Chapter 2, verse 42. Let's keep going. Chapter 2, verse 22. What characterized the early church? What did they spend their time doing? Verse 42 says, they were continually devoting themselves to TikTok. Is that what it says? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to, to prayer. Look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Verse 1. Peter and John were going to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of what? The hour of prayer. So they had set times. They wouldn't cut the Soktandas. They prayed the ninth, the twelfth, the sixth hour. They knew they had a set time of prayer. We can spend a whole another sermon to show the importance of having a set time of prayer. Chapter four the ministry is growing, people are are coming to faith but they have a problem the widows don't receive financial support 
Have I supported the ones that are widows, which the Bible says we must support? So the apostles recommend seven men to be able to focus on the issue of widows, on the issue of making sure that people's physical needs are taken care of. What do they say? We will focus our time in the ministry of the word and what? We will focus our time on the ministry of the word and to prayer. Acts chapter 6 verse 6. They have chosen the man to focus on people's, to take care of people's physical needs. They bring them forward and they brought them before the apostles and after praying, they laid hands on them. They laid hands on them. Stephen, Stephen, one of the men who was chosen, starts to share the gospel before them and they get angry. They are they are pricked to the heart because he's telling them the truth. But instead of being convicted, they want to stone him. They want to stone him. But Stephen, instead of condemning them and defending himself against them, he, Bible says, they were stoning Stephen, praying. Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And kneeling down, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin in their charge. And having said this, he fell asleep. Verses 59 to 16. Can continue. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Again, ministry is growing. Chapter 8, verse 15. But some people have not received the promise of the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and what? Prayed, Prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So even the receiving of the Holy Spirit comes through <coughs> prayer. It comes through prayer. Chapter 9. Chapter 9. Records the conversion of, of Saul. Remember Saul, when Stephen was being stoned, Saul was approving of his killing. But now he didn't know that he was part of God's mission. He didn't know that God was going to use him to now start to preach the very gospel he was against. And so in chapter 9 it records his conversion. It records his conversion of how he got saved on his way to Damascus. Verse 10, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said, get up. Go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man, not Judas Iscariot, for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is what? Praying. Praying. Right? It's almost like you can trust that something has happened to him. You can trust that he's no longer the Saul that he was. Why? Because now he's praying. Now he's praying. Go there to help this man out for he is praying. Chapter 10 records the gospel is now going global. The Jews who thought they had a copyright of the gospel. Now, God reveals to them that no, they must go and take the gospel to the Gentiles. So God starts to work in a man called Cornelius. 
she starts to work in a man called Cornelius who has a dream about seeing Peter come to them. Peter also has a dream, but somehow they get to meet each other and then Peter starts to preach the gospel to Cornelius. Verse chapter 10, verse 2, look at what it says about Cornelius. There was a man in Sicilia named Cornelius, and children of what was called Italian, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and what? Pray. Prayed to God continually. An angel appears to Cornelius and assures him, Thy prayers. Your prayers have gone up to God. Cornelius later relates this fact to Peter and adds an additional piece of information. He was praying when the angel appeared to him. Are you seeing this, Pazalak? Acts chapter 7. Sorry. Um, Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. We have a situation here when Peter is arrested, right? Peter is arrested for preaching the gospel. What is the church going to do? What is the church going to do? One of his own. One of the servants of God is arrested. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but what? Prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. Peter is in prison, but the church is praying. Acts chapter 16. You know the story when Paul and Silas were in prison, right? When they started to sing hymns, they were arrested for preaching the gospel. But the Bible talks about the fact that, verse 16, it happened that as we were going to the place of what? A slave girl having a spirit of divination met us. I think I lost my place here. I'm looking for the part where Paul and Silas are. Is that verse 25? Thank you. Verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were what? Praying, Praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Amen. Amen. Man, there's just so many, so much. We can continue here literally until Acts chapter 28 to show you places and to prove that the early church was dependent upon prayer. Go back to Acts chapter 1. There is no doubt that prayer prayer plays a critical role in the advancement of God's mission. If they had to depend upon God and they were with Jesus, amen, how much more us do we need to depend upon God so that the mission of God can advance? But lastly, the mission of God continues not only through the death, resurrection of Jesus, not only through the Holy Spirit, not only through prayer, but it continues through people. Through people. Where do I get that? It's from verse 15 to verse 26. So as I said, from verse 15, Peter starts standing up. He recognizes that they need to, to add an additional person because now Judas is no longer with them. So he interprets Psalm 69, 25 to 35 and applies it to Judas. He concludes that they need to replace Judas. 
So they pray and they throw lots for them and it falls upon a guy called Matthias. A guy called Matthias. And he is replaced as the 12th apostle who now replaces Judas. What is the significance of that? How does choosing Matthias relate to God's mission? It shows how God uses people to accomplish his mission. God uses people to accomplish his mission. Peter recognizes that for them to finish the mission, they need people. This is surely mission impossible, was Allah. Amen. <laughs> surely this is mission impossible. These guys don't have a college degree. These guys have no seminary training. These guys have no finances. These guys have no prestige. They have no political connections. They are commanded to go into all the world to tell a message of a guy who died on a cross, crucified by the Roman government. That's what you got going with. That's what you have, right? That's mission impossible. That's the mission that they are given. For the message to spread and people to believe them, they need a miracle to happen. Amen. So in that, we're going to see how in spite of their flaws, the Holy Spirit uses them to spread the message about Jesus. So to summarize, how will the mission continue now that Jesus is gone? Here's a, here's, here's a paragraph. The mission will continue through sinful men who preach, who say something, who testify, preach, testify, witness about the death and resurrection of Jesus through dependence upon God in prayer. Let me summarize that again. The mission of God will continue through sinful men. Amen. God's not going to use angels, right? He's going to use men to continue this mission. Who preach, testify, and witness about the death and resurrection of Jesus. They're not going to preach themselves, right? They're not going to preach motivational messages. They must preach Jesus. Amen? But they must do it through dependence upon God in prayer and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That is how the mission of God will continue. Amen. Amen. What does it mean for us? What does this mean for us? How does it apply to us? God, through empowerment by the Spirit, can use you to spread Christ in the mission field He has called you. Amen. Amen. God can use you to spread the message of the gospel through the mission field He has called you. Bazalani, here's how we preach the gospel. We have a two chapter gospel. It says fall, it says redemption. In a two chapter gospel, the only message you have, it starts with Genesis chapter 3 of 34. We messed up, and Jesus came to save us. Right? There's no. Place the only thing we're looking for is heaven, right? Yes. Which is great. Yes. Praise God for heaven. We're looking forward to heaven. But the gospel is not just two chapters. The gospel has more chapters. It's a five-chapter gospel. It's a five-chapter gospel. It doesn't just start with a fall, right? It starts with creation. Amen. It starts with God creating man 
It starts with creation being good. It starts with relationship being good. There's marriage in chapter 1. Amen. There's work in chapter 1. Amen. Work is good. And so if we're going to go out there and be witnesses, we have to think and say, how does it look like for somebody who's a Christian who's been saved by Christ to step into a situation empowered by the Holy Spirit and bring the mission of God in that place. So it's not just a two chapter gospel which starts at the fall and redemption, but it's a five chapter gospel which starts at creation, the fall happened, Jesus came, but here is the good news for us. This is where the act is. It's the continuation. Amen. You and me can be used by God to be able to continue his mission until there is restoration. A lot of us think that this empowerment, this mission, what it means here, it means we must just be pastors. We must be missionaries. Praise God for that. If God calls you that, go that direction. But that's not what it means. The empowerment of the gospel, the mission of God, also affects you as a student. Amen. It affects you as an entrepreneur. It affects you as a husband. It affects you as an accountant. Amen. The place where you are, that's your mission field. Are you listening to me, Bazaar? Yeah. Acts 1 verse 8 is also for you. You are called upon to continue to be a missionary in the place where God finds you. Amen. I find, I tell you, as black people, we have been enslaved and we have gone through a lot. And our grandmothers and our mothers hope for heaven and they praying us through. Praise the Lord for that. But where, where are the entrepreneurs that are going to find solutions for the township? Where are the accountants? Where are all the doctors? Where are the people that will find the, 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 the problem that we're having here? Do you know why I think they don't come out from the church? It's because in the church, we are more obsessed only about going to heaven. But we don't talk about what does it look like for us to have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue God's mission where he has placed us. So we don't dream. We don't think. We don't sit down and say, what is, how, does, how, how can I find a solution for this? We don't, think, we don't see God involved in those secular things. Because why? The only spiritual thing is that if I'm going to continue God's mission, I must be a pastor. Right? But what you do at your workplace is important. That's your mission for you. Amen. Amen. So we need a five chapter gospel. It starts with creation, fall, redemption, but that has renewal, what's currently happening. That God is busy renewing creation as a speak. Because Jesus came, because the kingdom came, came, has come, now we can carry on God's mission and make God famous. Amen. Amen. So wherever you find yourself, God can use you to carry his mission forward. Doesn't matter where you find yourself. You can be an agent of God's renewal here on earth. And that's what Acts 1.8 means for us. In the power of the Spirit, we've got to pray ourselves into it. We've got to trust the Spirit into it. We've we got to talk about Jesus, the death and resurrection. We can't talk about ourselves. So we need to find out, what does it mean that Jesus died? What does it mean for your marriage, right? What does the fact that Jesus died mean for your job, for you who, who does accounting? What does it mean for you as an athlete who plays soccer? How does Jesus affect 
that. We, these are the things that we need to start thinking about. These are the things that I hope you will discuss in your Bible study. How, what does it mean for us to carry the mission of God into our hearts? Let's pray. So Lord, we thank you for giving us this great mission. Thank you for purpose. Thank you for uh, legacy. Thank you for thinking ahead. Like you planned this thing to perfection. You didn't just leave and leave us stranded, but you left us with the Holy Spirit. You left us with the mandate. You left us. You covered us. Everything is, a, is, a, is accounted for. I pray that you may empower us, Lord. Empower us as a church. Empower us in the Spirit. Help us to press in. Give us supernatural, divine answers, solutions to problems that we may be able to fulfill your mission on earth. South Africa faces so many problems. Empower us by your Spirit to be agents of renewal. Not just objects, but agents of renewal. But to actually participate in finding solutions for our townships, for our country. Thank you that you empower us for this. We don't do it in our own strength. We don't have to make up a new message. The message is already there. I pray that Lord may do it depending upon you, trusting as you lead us, as you show us what to do, that we may step in and trust that you will lead us to what you want us to do. So if there's somebody here even this morning who doesn't know, maybe they feel like they, they, their life is useless. I pray that they may recognize and realize that even through this, now we have a place. Now our life is meaning. Now we are part of a bigger story. Now we can participate in the mission, the story that you're telling in the world. We don't have to live useless life. We don't have to waste our life. We don't have to just, just walk around and, and feeling like we, we, we don't matter. Use us, Lord, to bring Christ in the different pulpits that you have given us. In the different atmospheres you've given us. Give us ideas, Lord, of how to solve problems. May we not depend on other people from outside to keep coming and solving our problems, but empower your people through your spirit to keep on dominating the earth, to keep on the dominion mandate, to keep on making you famous through what you're doing in their hearts and their giftings in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.